Second half of April 1942. Being a civilian during World War II meant being trapped in a state between fear and hope. Not only because that is what war does to us, but because in many places all sides deliberately use the random threat of violent death to suspend people in a purgatory between doom and salvation, to break the spirits of those perceived as the enemy and pacify any opposition. Murdering some while allowing others to survive in vain hope, dropping bombs from dark night skies to kill randomly with little warning, branding a selection of people as the enemy, but not you all weapons in the arsenal of the war against humanity in 1942. This is War Against Humanity, a sub-series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. In the first half of April 1942, close to 80,000 American and Filipino prisoners of war on the Bataan Peninsula in the Philippines were forced to walk 106 kilometers or 66 miles to their prison camps under grueling conditions costing thousands their lives. In Burma, Japanese bombs on the city of Mandalay started a firestorm, killing roughly 2,000 citizens and refugees. At the same time, German and Italian airplanes dropped thousands of tons of bombs on Malta, all while they were plotting to bomb British historical cities. It's a direct response to the British bombing of Lübeck at the end of March, and another step in the constant escalation of retaliatory bombing raids against civilians that began in the early hours of September 1st, 1939, with the meaningless murder of civilians by bombing Vialun in Poland. These new German raids begin in the night of April 23rd to April 24th over Exeter with little damage, but the Luftwaffe planes return the following night, causing widespread destruction and killing 80 people on the ground and leaving many thousands of families homeless. The same night, the British Royal Air Force begins a new double blow attack on the German port of Rostock. The attack is set for four consecutive nights where explosive bombs first blow off the roofs, then incendiary bombs sets the city ablaze and dehouses its population. In parallel, on the third and fourth night, the Luftwaffe attacks Bath, causing significant damage and around 400 casualties. In Rostock, the RAF has now dropped 800 tons of bombs, killed 200 and dehoused tens of thousands into homelessness. In the following night, the Luftwaffe attacked Norwich, dropping 90 tons of bombs and killing 67. From April 28th to 29th, they bombed York, causing limited damage to the city, but 79 deaths. On April 24th, the new German raids get the name Bedecker Blitz, when Gustav Braun von Stumm, a spokesman for the German Foreign Office, makes an off-the-cuff public remark that we shall go out and bomb every building in Britain marked with three stars in the Bedecker Guide. The comment reportedly enrages Reichspropaganda Minister Josef Goebbels, who doesn't want it known that they are deliberately targeting cultural and historic sites. He tries to get the comments walked back, but the cat is out of the bag, and that is how they are still remembered. Further east, the Germans and their allies are performing other, even deadlier forms of de-housing operations, thinly disguised as anti-partisan raids. Here, the cycle of escalation starts with German atrocities that stoke partisan activity that in turn escalates the actions against civilians, which further escalates partisan activity with the population caught in between. But the Nazi activities are far more than a response. Although they call it Bandenbekämpfung, or bandit fighting, in reality it's yet another way to wage war against perceived ethnic enemies, much like the brutal persecution of Jewish looters back in the fall of 1941. One of the worst places hit is occupied Belarus. In February, one of the veterans of Germany anti-partisan activities, Oskar Dielewanger, arrives here with his brigade of murderers. Sonderkommando Dielewange was formed in early 1940 to carry out mass murders against potential Polish national resistance. Originally, the commando was staffed by convicted poachers, but over the past year they have continued to recruit from a wide range of convicted violent criminals and dishonorably discharged men of the Wehrmacht and the SS. Now let that sink in for a moment. 
tells you everything you need to know about how ruthless they are. In fact, the reputation of the commando is so bad that not even the SS will take them up into their ranks. In an effort to balance the scales, Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler has acquiesced that they are not officially part of the SS as such, but place them in the line of command of the SS Totenkopfverbände. Himmler has sent Dielewanger to Belarus to explicitly start off the Bandenbekämpfung. The Germans and their allies have so far been fairly ineffective in fighting the actual partisans. By now, there are tens of thousands of them hiding in the vast forests and marshes of Belarus, only coming out to resupply or carry out hit-and-run attacks. Not even broad-sweeping actions like Operation Bamberg in the area of the Lusk district south of Bobrusk in the eastern Polesi that concluded on April 9, 1942, is making a dent. Somewhere between 1,200 and 2,000 partisans were known to be active in the area, but already before this operation started, it was concluded that with winter conditions turning into spring thaw, entering the soggy forest to actually fight the partisans would be impossible. Instead, forces of the German Wehrmacht, Slovak infantry, and SS order police encircle a pocket of roughly 25 by 30 kilometers and then go from village to village, killing indiscriminately. Mostly in mass shootings, but also by blowing up their houses or burning them alive inside. When they are done, 6,000 civilians, Belarusian Slav peasants and non-partisan Jews are dead. The partisans they were ostensibly hunting, well, they slip away into the night while the Axis forces murder the innocent. Sadly, these very same people are also victims of these partisans who live off the land by plundering and even murdering villagers and townspeople that don't willingly give up their food or are even only vaguely suspected of collaborating with the Germans. But Dielewanger is about to take things to new levels of horror. One of his favorite methods to clean out a village where partisans have been known to be active is to round up all of the inhabitants, single out the most attractive women and girls for gang rape and then murder, lock the rest together with the men and children in a barn and set it ablaze. Machine guns are set up to shoot anyone trying to escape. Night after night, day after day, Villages and settlements fall to Dielewanger's band of brutes, killing hundreds that add up to thousands. The only military effect it has is to drive even more fighting aged men and women to join the partisans. To the southwest from here, another large scale anti partisan operation begins now in April. In former Yugoslavia, the Axis forces are also struggling. Earlier operations like the one in Uzice last year were relatively successful, but did not actually halt partisan operations. Since then, Josip Broz Tito's partisans have moved to eastern Bosnia. They called their liberated area the Foča Republic, after the city of Foča. It includes roughly 100 towns and villages and is host to roughly 10,000 strong coalition of local partisan and Chetnik fighters. On March 31st, the Croat Ustasha Black Legion, under leadership of Jure Francetic, start a concerted attack on the region, raping, plundering, and murdering their way through village after village, town after town, including a mass murder at Vlasenica where 890 people are killed. For German General Paul Bada, this signals the time to start Operation Trio. His 718th Infantry Division, aided by Croatian Home Guard troops, is to consolidate power and restore order in the region, while three Italian divisions under leadership of General Mario Raotta are to close the lines. This is where it gets confusing. All the sides want to extend their control over the area and have conflicting methods of doing so. The Croats want to see the partisans and mainly Serb Chetniks gone for ideological and ethnic reasons. The Germans are against the partisans because they're communists, but dislike the Chetniks because their anti-Muslim violence might strengthen the partisan cause. The Italians want to gain control over the area and don't mind the Chetniks as much, who they tolerate and even utilize in this fight. Some Chetniks see an opportunity to fight communism and join the Axis against the partisans. The partisans, opposed by everyone, are not interested in an all-out clash and attempt to flee the battleground altogether. 
Absolute chaos ensues. Large part of the Italian force arrive too late to close the gaps in the lines, and a great many partisans succeed to thread the needle. Despite that, with Tito gone, it looks like the Axis have regained control. But it's just a change of battlefield. Tito is now consolidating his forces to western Bosnia instead. In a rather unusual turn of events, this story ends with the Germans and Italians seen as the heroes of the story. For once, the civilian population is spared from reprisals, and for months they have been held hostage by the partisans and Chetniks, and then came the Black Legion. The population of Rogaticha was cut off for months and has suffered massive hunger. There have been accounts from all sides that people have been eating grass. There was a heartfelt reception for the German troops, reflecting the hopes of a better future in the people's emaciated faces. All inhabitants turned out onto the streets to greet their liberators. That's definitely not the case everywhere. The position of Jews throughout occupied Europe becomes more and more desperate with each day that passes. The first transports of Jews from places like France, Germany, and Slovakia have already arrived at concentration camps and ghettos in Eastern Europe. Those who are still living in relative freedom are increasingly pushed to the fringes of their societies. In occupied Netherlands, Jewish people are forced to wear the yellow star on April 29th. Such measures had already been imposed in many countries like Poland, Romania, Germany, Austria, Luxembourg, and Slovakia. In the coming summer, many more countries will follow. Just a yellow piece of cloth. But it effectively splits the community in two, the Jews and the others, or rather, the non-Jews and the others, good versus bad, us versus them. It's another step in dehumanization, branded, banned from places associated with health or success. They have become poor and look deplorable, artificially confirming the propaganda that Jews are vermin. Many are just happy that it's not them. This selective targeting is not just used to drive a wedge between Jews and Gentiles, but among the future Jewish victims to keep them under control by making it look like they're only really going after some Jews. The Nazis lead the others to believe that if they obey, keep their head down, survive another day, they can hope to eventually get through this. That survivor's hope is what leads the inhabitants of the Warsaw Ghetto to stay calm after the ghetto's first wave of public murders in mid-April 1942. So far, the ghetto has been a mortal hellhole to live in, but spared from any of the mass murders that so many other ghettos have suffered. On the night of Friday, April 17th, this changes when a group of SS men and the Jewish ghetto police go from house to house hunting down people that have been aiding others beyond the permissible. All in all, they kill 52 men and women by shooting them in the streets. Panic starts to break out, but in the morning, as people see that they are not going to die themselves, a false sense of security sets in, or as Manuel Ringerblum, the ghetto chronicler, notes. The mood in the street has somewhat improved. People calmed down and started to be a little bit more optimistic. They have chosen to believe what the German authorities ordered the head of the Judenrat in the ghetto, Adam Cherniakov, to announce. The action of the night of 17th to 18th of April 1942 was sporadic in its nature in order to punish those who do not mind their own business. It is recommended to the population to calmly deal with their normal affairs and then such actions will not happen again. It's under this awning of this false sense of security that thousands follow the orders of the Germans, hoping until it is too late that they will be spared. By the end of April, in this way, roughly 75,000 Jews from other ghettos in Poland have been transported to their death in the industrial murder facility at Bebczyk. In a strange interlude, the killing then stops there. Bevzic Commandant Christian Wirt and his staff pack up their things, kill the 50 remaining Jewish guards and workers, leave the camp, and head to Berlin. His commander, Odilo Globocznik, only finds out after the fact, doesn't know why, and certainly has not allowed it. 
We still don't really know why Viet left, but we do know that Globochnik disagrees and will order Viet to resume his command of Bivšić later in May. The pause also doesn't put a stop to the murders by gas, as in late April, the Sobibor extermination facility begins operations. And while the systematic mass murders of Jews begin there, a team of SS officers, engineers, and Soviet POW laborers arrive at a small village about 80 kilometers east of Warsaw. They will use the experience collected at Bevšić and Sobibor to construct their magnum opus, the perfect extermination factory, Treblinka. It is here that most of the men, women, and children of the Warsaw Ghetto who breathe sighs of relief this month will be deprived of their final breath. Never forget. Mm -hmm.